Tell me about this documentary. The name of the documentary is Murder Rap, uh, Inside the Biggie and Tupac Murder Investigations. It's based on um, the 2011 book that I published, Murder Rap. And it's, uh, it's, it's like the book on steroids. It has all kinds of audio interviews and, uh, and uh, documents that uh, we couldn't put in the book. And it basically tells the entire story of what took place in these murders. Okay. Now, there has been multiple books about these murders. And it seems like th there's been a number of ex, I believe, LAPD investigators that after they retired, they went and released books. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? Yeah, and there, there really hasn't been a, a number of books uh, is, in regard as you've got, you know, John Potash's book about the FBI being high, behind Tupac's killing. Okay. And then you have Labyrinth, which is a book that was um, written by um, Randall Sullivan, where he collaborated with uh, Russell Poole, another ex-LAPD guy, and they proposed a theory uh, that LA cops were involved in Biggie's murder. Um, but that theory was wholly refuted and uh, um, unlike that book, um, we just used evidence from the case in order to uh, write murder rap and tell the story uh, from a very transparent perspective. And uh, you know, we let the investigation take us where the evidence took us. We didn't have a motive to try to prove something um, based on preconceived notions. So tell me about the book that actually alleges that the FBI orchestrated Tupac's death. There's a book out there that uh, promotes the idea that the, f that the government, the FBI, um, were I instrumental in Tupac's death because he was this aspiring um, rapper with political aspirations and they wanted to silence him before he could get a movement going. Well, he was not aspiring. He was a very established rapper. He was already a multi-platinum. He was probably the biggest rapper in the world at that point. Yeah. And, and he was, he did come from a Black Panther background. Correct. And he was definitely riling people up in terms of what he felt was unjust uh, treatment of African Americans in America. Correct. And uh, so I, I'm not here, to, I'm not refuting all of that. I'm just simply saying that to then make the leap to murder is, is uh, really, um, it, 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 it's a big chasm. There's no evidence to support it, and that's the problem. Sure, you can create a motive. You can say, well, here's why they would do it. But it's, you don't, meaning, motive is meaningless unless you have evidence connecting the motive to the crime. And that's the difference here, is there's nothing to, sub to support such a, a theory. So in terms of your documentary, what is different about your documentary rather than the other theories and the other books that have come out previously? The difference in our documentary is it's all fact-based. It's evidence-based um, uh, information. It comes from inside the investigation, not from outside. So we had all of the material uh, to rely on, uh, access to everything. And so that's the difference. It wasn't based on speculation and innuendo. It was based on facts and evidence. Well. People are going to look at this and say, you guys have this great documentary where you feel that you've solved the murders of Biggie and Tupac, but here we are coming into 2016 and no one's been convicted for the murders of Biggie and Tupac. That's right. It's very unfortunate. Uh, just a um, unfortunate chain of events. You know, we didn't solve the crimes until long after the fact. You know, we didn't develop this evidence until 2009, you know, 13 years after Tupac's murder and 12 years after Biggie's murder. So you guys create this documentary about the murders of Biggie and Tupac. And you say that it's all fact-based, it's all internal, it solves all these questions that everyone has. But here we are in 2016 and no one's been convicted for these crimes. And they're still unsolved by LAPD and Las Vegas PD. Yeah, you're right. It doesn't sit right that, uh, that we could have this kind of information and evidence and nobody goes to jail. Uh, but we have to keep in mind that when we've obtained this information, it's 13 years after the murder of Tupac Shakur and 12 years after the murder of Biggie. Right, but to be fair, 
there is no statute of limitations for murder. Correct. There's no statute of limitations for murder. However, you still have to have, uh, you know, people to charge. Orlando Anderson's dead. DeAndre's dead. Um, you know, Keefe's own confession is protected against self-incrimination. Uh, many of the witnesses are, are, have passed on. So, you know, when you look at it in the totality of circumstances, it's a very, very difficult case to try to charge either of them because we didn't develop the critical information till long after the fact. However, we can tell you definitively that this is what took place um, on March 7th of, uh, I'm sorry, March 9th of 1997 and September 9th of 1996. We know what took place and it's been established through empirical evidence. So the only person that could really be charged at this point in the Tupac murder is Keefe D. Of the conspirators that were in the car that night, uh, Keefe D is the, is the sole survivor. Right. So at this point, there's really no one that could even testify against him. Uh, correct. Unless someone claims that he told them and then they turn around, but then that becomes... That becomes hearsay. That becomes hearsay. There's no actual, or, or if someone actually at the crime scene comes forward and... Like Suge Knight himself. You know, right. Suge Knight knew exactly who was in that Cadillac. Uh, Keefe D and Suge Knight were childhood friends. They'd known each other for years. Suge Knight looked across the car directly into Keefe D's eyes. He knew exactly who had shot at him and Tupac that night, which is exactly why the um, you know, mini war started in Compton the next day. Um, but there was never any question in, in Suge Knight's mind who that was. And all he had to do was simply sit down with Las Vegas investigators and say, I recognized Keefe D in the front seat of that car. And that would have led to uh, them being able to, to develop a prosecutable case against everybody there. Why do you think Suge Knight didn't do that? It's not in his nature to cooperate with uh, law enforcement. He would rather handle things on the street and uh, maintain his reputation. Uh, as opposed to cooperating with the cops and being labeled a snitch. And it's, it's, it's not the code that he lives by. What happened after the, the Tupac shooting in Compton? Uh, immediately after Tupac was shot, uh, members of the mob Piru and their affiliate blood gangs got together and, uh, and decided that they'd retaliate against the Southside Crips for, uh, for what had happened. Okay, and, and what happened after, at that point? There was some sporadic shootings taking place between the neighborhoods. It was a, you know, one of these like um, on-site type of um, atmospheres where if you see members of the rival crew, you know, trying to gun them down. Uh, but it's a lot more difficult than people think. You have to go into your rival's neighborhood to find them, which means you're exposing yourself um, to the same kind of danger that you're there to, you know, that you're there to, uh, to do. What did you, in, in terms of your investigation, what did you know about Orlando Anderson in terms of his reputation, his criminal record, and his alleged criminal activities? Orlando Anderson was known as a shooter. Um, so was Terrence Brown. Uh, they were involved in uh, prior, you know, prior um, uh, criminal activities, uh, violent criminal activities. Uh, you know, Orlando had a bank robbery. Uh, Terrence Brown had been in a, uh, a shooting, with, or I'm sorry, a uh, uh, encounter where he was shot 10 times, all of this prior to Las Vegas. So these guys were active criminal uh, gang members. And uh, this was all just part of, you know, um, living out, uh, living out that mold. Was Orlando actually being investigated for murders or shootings or anything else like that? Yeah, at the time of uh, the Tupac Shakur murder, Orlando Anderson was already in under investigation uh, by Compton PD for another murder. I think the guy's, the victim's name in that was Albert Webb or something uh, to that effect. Okay. Did you know about, uh, about Sanika Shakur, Monster? I know who Monster is, yes. Okay. There was a, I believe, a Vibe interview where Monster said that he had been in the same, he was in the same prison as Suge, and he said that Suge told him that Orlando was the shooter. Did you investigate this at all? 
Yeah, I've heard that claim. Um, obviously, um, that corroborates Keefe D and it corroborates the idea that Suge knew exactly who it was. Um, so uh, I'm not surprised to hear that. Um, but again, unless, Sh unless Shakur is willing to step forward and take the witness stand, which we both know he wouldn't do, that uh, becomes unusable information. So from your point of view, you talk about monster, uh, Seneca Shakur. Let's just say monster, because you'll, you'll start saying, sh you'll say Shakur and people will <laughs> I know. assume it's Tupac Shakur. So, from a gang point of view, why would a gang member do an interview with Vibe magazine and essentially state a bunch of inside criminal information, but yet not, co but feel that that's any different than working with the police and saying the exact same thing because can't that actually be used as evidence, an interview? It can be used as impeachment evidence um, if he were ever to put up, put up on a stand and uh, questioned and he gave another answer than what he'd previously said publicly, then they could, you know, impeach him with that or use that to establish his credibility, either or. So it just depends. Um, a lot of people uh, speak to uh, news outlets and magazines and they'll tell the story that they have to tell, but that doesn't mean they're willing to sit down and provide that inf same information to the cops and then be willing to take the stand. Perfect examples are individuals like Frank Alexander and Kevin Hackey who promote books and DVDs about what they think happened but then when they're, you know, when they're required to go to depositions and required to testify in court, all of a sudden they get amnesia or they, you know, um, become afraid of uh, the repercussions of testifying in court. So you can actually use an interview as part of a conviction? No, you can't. Uh, convictions have to be based on courtroom testimony, courtroom evidence. Okay. But you can use it, as I said, in order to impeach a witness if they get up on the stand and say something other than what they've said publicly. Well, when you say uh, impeachment, does that mean uh, perjury? Or is that different? Well, it can be perjury if you're proving what they're saying on the stand is the lie. Now, if the lie was the newspaper article and what they're saying on the stand is the truth, that's not perjurious, hmm. right? Is that impeachment? It can be impeachment. Uh, that's what the defense would say. If an individual is on the stand and says, hey, this is what I actually saw, and an attorney will say, well, what about this article where you said you saw something different? And it's going to depend on whether that information that he's testifying to on the stand benefits the defense or does it benefit the prosecution. These are the issues that you work out in court. There was a mutual friend in Dallas who had worked with Lonzo in some capacity as a DJ. Uh -huh. And uh, when the Boys in the Hood record started to get some, some action, yeah. uh, this dude brought those guys to Dallas. I ain't blow up because my shit look real and authentic. Not no fool, you know, foolery. Motherfuckers using CO2 guns and shit. Boy, nah, man. Nah. Yeah, no, no. Nah. Yeah, bro, yeah, it bro, ain't bro, like bro. that.